good shooting is never an accident. Fighter pilots knocking down zeros in the far Pacific and Messerschmitts over the continent all came by their skill the hard way. It was a tedious job of habit building designed to develop instantaneous and correct responses to quick happening events. Through constant repetition, the right actions became instinctive. Thus, instinctively correct gunnery in practice became instinctively correct gunnery in combat. Practice firing on ground target ranges has proved its great value in fixing the habits that spell success in actual combat. Let's take a look at such a target range as the student gunner might see it for the first time from the air. Not unlike an oversized football gridiron, it's a cleared area approximately one mile long by a half a mile wide. A little more than midway down the field, we see a narrow strip of bare earth, usually marked off with whitewashed planking. This is the range line. 600 feet farther on is the foul line, also clearly marked in white. Beyond that, another 600 feet are the targets. These targets are tilted at an angle of 60 degrees from the ground. This 60 degree angle places the target perpendicular to the airplane's line of flight, which in the ideal approach is the 30 degree dive. Over at one end of the foul line is the range house, a small bulletproof building for the use and protection of the range crew. From this shelter, the range crew signals to the pilot. When the range is closed to firing, a red warning panel is turned up. Firing when this red panel is displayed subjects the gunner to severe disciplinary action. When the range is clear and it's safe for firing, a white or striped panel is shown. From the range house, a watch is also kept for violations of the rules. When a pilot commits a foul, such as firing after passing the foul line, he gets a red signal flag. But let's get back to our target. They're six feet high and ten feet wide, with a scoring area six feet by six feet. Any bullet hole within this six by six area is scored as a hit. Scores are figured as percental rating against the total number of rounds expended. 30% qualifies the gunner as an expert, 20% as a sharpshooter, and 15% as a marksman. When a flight has completed its mission, scores are called into the range house, where they're figured against the number of fouls the gunner may have committed. Final results are then phoned back to the field. Thus, by the time the flight returns from its mission, each pilot's score is waiting for him. Let's go along with the typical gunnery mission as they check out for the target range. principles of successful ground gunnery are the same regardless of the type of airplane used. Therefore, in discussing operational procedure, we can simplify matters by concentrating on one type, the AT-6. Furthermore, a student can learn all the important fundamentals of gunnery by practicing with one fixed machine gun of comparatively light caliber. If he learns to hit his target with a single fixed 30 caliber gun, it's an easy step to the skillful handling of multiple guns of higher caliber. After loading and checking have been completed to each pilot's satisfaction, the airplanes take off in an extended string formation and head for the target range. Normally, four to six airplanes participate in a mission led by an instructor. The flight we are using in this discussion has four elements. Arriving over the range at 1,500 feet, they find another flight still using it. They 
They circle at that height until the first flight has finished its mission and the range crew has finished its work. panel is displayed, the instructor leads his flight down to the 700-foot level and into the rectangular traffic pattern, directing the other pilots to take spacing on it. The base leg of this pattern is parallel to and some distance back of the range line. How far back will depend upon the wind, since the pilot must reach a predetermined speed when he passes the foul line, and it must be reached without using the throttle during the approach. To accomplish this, Headwinds or tailwinds must be compensated for by moving the base leg nearer to or farther from the range line. After completing his run on the target, the pilot climbs to 700 feet and maintains that altitude while flying the traffic pattern. Whether turns are to be made to the left or right will be announced by the flight leader after each phase of the event. Similarly, each pilot will have been told which target has been assigned to him. It's customary for the flight leader to take the first target, number two the next target, and so on. Constant speed is essential to the pilot seeking high scores. For the AT-6, that speed is 120 miles per hour in level flight and 160 miles per hour in the dive. Each pilot will be told in advance how many attacks he is allowed. Thus, by knowing how much ammunition he has and the number of attacks to be made, it's a simple job to calculate the length of the burst that he should fire on each run. Before starting to fire, each pilot is allowed two practice attacks on the target. These are called dry runs. Among other things, these dry runs permit the student to establish his base leg and get properly spaced in the traffic pattern. The ideal distance between ships is to have the pilot ahead completing his pass on the target as the next pilot makes his last turn down to fire. Also on dry runs, the wise student will study the wind stop and determine wind velocity and direction. On the first dry run, set the rudder tab so that in the 160 mile an hour dive on the target, the airplane flies with the ball in the center without the rudder being held. Also, to better groove his pattern, the smart pilot will pick out a landmark, such as a road intersection, and turn over it every time. Although the figures vary for all types of airplanes, the AT-6 should show a manifold pressure of 21 to 23 inches of mercury at 1900 RPM at a 700 foot altitude. On the second dry run, adjust the horizontal stabilizer so the airplane will be slightly nose heavy at 160 miles per hour. rather difficult to handle while flying the traffic pattern with the nose down setting, so after completing the firing attack on each run, it should be re-trimmed. Then just before the dive to the target is begun, it should be trimmed to its nose-heavy position. It's extremely important that all turns be made smoothly and at 90 degrees. Particularly is this true of the last turn to the target. Always remember that nothing is more conducive to good shooting than smooth flying.
Beginning his firing attack, the student will count his runs on the target by using the directional gyro, which, before his first pass, is set at zero and left case. Also at this point, he charges his gun. Turning onto the target, he snaps on the gun's safety switch. Then everything depends on how intelligently he uses his knowledge of flying and ballistics. After each firing attack, he snaps off the gun's safety switch and advances the gyro up one number. Completing his turn toward the target, the wise gunner is relaxed, content to get his speed near and below the target. He does not simply aim at the target as a whole. He picks out a definite point. That's the spot he'll shoot at on each attack. By doing so, he can group his shots, determine his errors when the scores come in, and make intelligent corrections. To eliminate over-controlling, wait until the airplane is approximately over the range line before bringing the sight to bear. Just before firing, take up any slack in the elevator cables with the airplane still trimmed slightly nose heavy. This helps compensate for the back pressure of trigger squeeze and the pull-out tightness of the pilot. Since there is considerable travel in stick figures, it's best to begin flexing the trigger at about the same time the sight feed is being moved into the bullseye. The firing burst should be a short one, and only one burst should be fired in each pass. If the pilot has time to fire more than one, he's either fouling or his first burst was fired too far back. Firing after the foul line is passed is a serious violation, primarily because it's dangerous. It indicates that the pilot is not allowing himself enough time for a safe pull-up thus standing a good chance of flying right through the target. <whistles> Furthermore, if he were handling an actual fighter plane, the fire from his harmonized guns, instead of converging on the target, would converge beyond it. When steadiness is impossible, better to make a dry run without firing. This can be made up by firing slightly longer bursts on later attacks. Follow through is extremely important. After a burst is completed, the bead should be held on the target for a fraction of a second. Otherwise, a laddered burst will result, caused by the pull-out being started before the trigger is released. If the burst, the follow through and the pull-out are carefully timed, not only is a safe altitude assured, but also the groundwork for high scoring will have been well established. In firing on ground targets, the airplane and the bullet trajectory are affected by wind direction. Therefore, the pilot should use the wind sock and dust kicked up by bullets striking behind the target to guide him. Riding a tailwind as he dives on the target, the gunner should aim slightly low. Bucking a headwind, he should aim slightly high. Crosswinds are even trickier, for not only are the bullets deflected, but also the airplane tends to drift, causing the sight to drift across the target. To solve this difficulty, the best procedure is to make a coordinated turn into the target, leading the target slightly. Fire a short burst paying close attention to the pattern of dust back of the target. When an aiming point is found that's approximately correct, fire at that spot every time. Another important factor is the necessity of always making smooth 90-degree turns. Skids ruin accuracy. So do slips and rough banks. A skidding airplane has a speed to one side or the other of the direction in which it is pointed. Thus, a bullet fired from a skidding plane has a similar side velocity. And no matter how careful the aim, that bullet cannot hit where the gun is pointing, for the initial side velocity, even though it be slight, is enough to take it quite clear of the target. Smooth flying is the greatest contributing factor to high scoring. Stick and rudder must be used together to bring the sights to bear on the target. Smart flyer will discipline himself until smooth flying is second nature. 
No attack, dry or firing, may be made unless the range is open. It should become habitual, therefore, before starting a run on the target, to make sure the all-clear panel is showing. The pilot must never bring his gun to bear on another airplane or on any populated area. So watch your spacing in the traffic pattern. The gun safety switch must be turned off after each attack, just as the climb away from the target is begun. Occasionally, faulty ammunition or a malfunctioning gun may cause a jam. A first position stoppage is the only one that can be cleared in the air. The safety switch is turned off and the gun is charged. If this fails, the charging handle is locked in the rear position and all switches are turned off at once. The pilot with a jammed gun stays in the traffic pattern with the remainder of the flight until the mission is completed. After landing, he does not try to clear the gun himself, but calls a qualified armorer immediately. Rarely, a pilot will encounter a runaway gun. When this happens, he flies straight ahead out of the traffic pattern. He pulls back, locks the charging handle, and climbs to 1,500 feet. After reaching the 1,500-foot level, he circles at that altitude until the remainder of the flight finishes its mission, always keeping a sharp lookout lest he endanger other planes which might be approaching the range. As his flight leaves the target range and returns to the field, he drops down to 700 feet again and takes position well to the rear of the flight. Back at the field, he does not attempt to land until the ships he has been following have landed and moved onto the taxi strip. He never taxis or parks in such a way as to endanger anyone. constant practice, repetition of the right things to do over and over again, and you hope to find your name up near the head of the list on the scoring chart. But when that day comes, you can be sure that the lessons you have learned with the AT-6 and its single 6 30 caliber gun will stand you in good stead when you switch over to faster, deadlier fighting planes like this T-47. Then when you go into combat, you'll need only to draw your bead on that so-called rising sun insignia that the obliging little dapples have fashioned so closely after the manner of a target's bullseye. Draw your bead and squeeze your trigger, and you'll have the satisfaction of seeing the rising sun consumed in a blazing sunset of destruction.